Moving clocks run slowly, and moving things contract in the direction of their motion. Those are two of the amazing conclusions of special relativity. And here's why they happen. It's actually pretty simple. What I've drawn here is the simplest clock anyone can think of. It's just a tube with mirrors on both ends and some light trapped between them. And so the light bounces up and down between the mirrors. It's a great clock because there are no mechanical parts. It can never wear out or break down or slow down. So, for the sake of making things a little bit easier, we're going to say that the height of the clock is the distance that light travels in one second. That's a pretty large clock, but of course it would work for any size, but it just makes the numbers a little easier. So, in one second, the light bounces from the bottom to the top, and the clock ticks every time it reaches one of the ends. It ticks every second. So the height of the clock is C. C is a symbol for the speed of light. It's a pretty big number, 300,000 kilometers per second. Now, so this clock ticks once every second. What if it moves at high velocity? Well, if we put it in a truck ourselves and drive the truck off at high velocity, we're not going to observe anything at all happen to the clock because we don't have any motion relative to the clock. So none of the effects of special relativity can happen if we don't have any relative motion. The interesting stuff happens if somebody else puts the clock in a truck and drives off at high velocity. So let's say that happens, and we'll say the velocity is v, and we'll let one second go by. So this whole thing moves over in this direction by a distance v, because one second has gone by. So here's the light clock after one second on our clock. Our clock is not moving with respect to us. Um, where did the light get to after one second on our clock? Did it get all the way to the top of that moving clock, thereby indicating one second on the moving clock? Well, no it didn't, because the central thing about special relativity, and really central observation about nature and how nature works, is that the speed of light is invariant. It doesn't depend on what the observer is doing, uh, the velocity of the observer, or anything like that. So we have to measure the same speed of light, even if the clock is moving. And I've calibrated the length of the clock to be equal to the length of this ruler. So therefore, after one second, the light can only have moved the length of this ruler. And let's see if it can get to the top of that clock. No, it can't get to the top of that clock. Not at all. In fact, it can only get this far. I'll actually draw the entire path of the light as seen by us. There it is. So therefore, after one second goes by on our stationary clock, less than one second has gone by according to the truck driver. The truck driver would say about two-thirds of a second has gone by. So, moving clocks run slowly. How much slower do they run? Well, it depends on how fast they're moving. As you can imagine, if I had drawn a bigger velocity, the second light clock would be farther over here in this direction. And therefore, to, again, only go that distance of this ruler, then the light would have to be even farther down and have to have counted off even less time on the truck driver's clock. Now, we'll do just a little bit of geometry to figure out the exact amount. So bear with me, it's really not that hard. What we can do is note that the length of this red diagonal here is length c, because that's the distance that light traveled in one second. The length of this line segment here is just v, that's the same as down here. So we want to ask what's the length of this red segment here? And we just use the Pythagorean theorem to get square root of c squared minus v squared, right? Now we can change this around a little bit by pulling out one factor of c from inside the square root. We have c minus the square root of v squared over c squared. Now this whole thing, square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, is pretty cumbersome. So in relativity, we define something called gamma, which is just 1 over this square root thing. So this whole thing will equal c divided by gamma. Now gamma is nicely defined so that at a velocity of 0, it, gamma equals 1, and at a high velocity, it's much larger than one. It can reach hundreds or thousands or millions if you're very close to the speed of light. All right, so we've established that the length of this red line segment here is c divided by gamma. But remember that the height of the entire clock was c. That's how we set up the problem. It's the distance that light travels in one second. That's how we built our clock. So this length here is gamma times shorter than the height of the clock. Now, here's what we've been waiting for. The amount of time that it takes 
for the driver's clock to tick one second is the amount of time that the light would take to continue past this point and go all the way up here, right? Now the cool thing about this is this is this black triangle here is a similar triangle to the red triangle. It's got all the same angles, it's just a little bit bigger. And specifically note that it's gamma times bigger because we've already compared these legs of the triangle. So the hypotenuse side has to be gamma times bigger. So its length is C gamma. And this top side's length is V gamma. All right, so what that means is by the time the truck driver's clock has ticked off one second, gamma seconds have gone by on our clock. So we would say that the truck driver's clock is running slowly. What about length contraction? It's actually intimately related because from the truck driver's point of view, after one second has ticked off on his clock, we would say that he's moved a distance V gamma. But that can't be right because we've stated that the truck was moving a distance V. So, from the truck driver's point of view, he can only be moving a distance V in the time that it takes his clock to tick one second because our relative velocity is V. So, it must be that the truck driver measures this distance that we call V gamma he must measure it as a distance v in order for him to be going at the velocity. And so it is an effect of the time dilation that the lengths have to contract as well. Now there's a nice way to summarize all this and make a picture that I think will really stick in your head to so remember it later. We're going to eliminate all the details from this diagram, just strip it down to its bare essentials. And we're going to draw the left light clock as just a vertical line and then we'll draw an axis here representing velocity. Remember, the higher the velocity, the farther out the second light clock is going to be. And actually, the farthest out it can go is C. So if a light clock is traveling at the speed of light, it could get all the way out here at a velocity of C. And using this, this is the distance that light can go in one second, we're going to draw a quarter of a circle connecting these. All right. So now what you do, if you know you're traveling at a velocity of v, let's say 9 tenths of the speed of light, we would go 9 tenths of the way out here, and we would draw a dashed line up to the circle, and that's where we can put the needle of our speedometer. So you can think of this as a speedometer. Going pretty fast, but we haven't put the pedal to the metal yet. Now, if you draw a dashed line over here, that's how much the length contraction and time dilation factor gamma is. This segment here is gamma times shorter than this entire distance. And let's do it for one other velocity just to make sure you've got the hang of it. So we can erase everything to do with this particular velocity. Now let's say we're going at a pretty slow speed, say one tenth of the speed of light. We would go over one tenth of the way and we would go up to the circle and there we see that if we put the speedometer needle there, oops, I didn't draw a very straight line, but you get the idea. Then we draw the dashed line over. Well, we don't have very much length contraction or time dilation at all at a tenth of the speed of light. It's basically a negligible effect. And one more example. We'll go at the exciting speed of 99% of the speed of light. We're going to draw as far over here as we can get. And we draw a little dashed line up. Unfortunately, my drawing is not as straight as it could be, but we'll put this needle here at 99% of the speed of light, and we can draw a dashed line over. And we see that we have quite a bit of contraction. We have about a factor of 10 contraction at 99% of the speed of light.